Zero Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. Uh, Monsieur Kildall, est-ce que je peux avoir un dollar? You got me on that one. <laughs> what I was asking you was, would you lend me a dollar? <laughs> Only I was using the French language mm -hmm. to communicate to your brain, your computer, and I guess you're programmed in the English language, so you didn't perform the program the way I hoped you would, and you didn't give me the dollar. Uh, the point of this little story is that our subject today is computer programming languages, Gary, and of course there are many languages you can program in, just like there are many languages we can speak in. Uh, before we talk about these different individual programming languages, I thought you might explain the different levels of computer language. Well, there are three major levels of computer programming languages that sort of depend upon uh, your level of sophistication, what you're going to use a language for. Uh, the lowest level is what's called machine language, and that's the language the machine understands, the ones and the zeros. Mm -hmm. uh, the next level up from that is what they call systems languages, and uh, the languages like the programming language C would be in that category. And that's, those languages are used to uh, program applications, such as wor uh, word processors or spreadsheets. And then the third level, the highest level, is what's called an application language or an end-user language. And those languages like Fortran, COBOL, Logo, so forth, fit into that category. And so we'll get a chance today to talk about some of those languages and see how they're used. Okay, indeed, we'll see a demonstration of COBOL, Forth, uh, Logo. We'll talk about Pascal. First, though, let's try to understand a bit better this problem created by having so many different programming languages. This multilingual keyboard can perform the tasks of interpreter, grammatical advisor, and artist in translating English sounds into Japanese text. The program does for human languages what most computers are incapable of doing with their own languages. Because machine codes vary from one microprocessor to another, the same programming language cannot be shared by two different computers. For example, Apple Basic is not IBM Basic. A language customized for one machine will not run on another. Like their human counterparts, computer programming languages differ in structure, syntax, code, and even symbols. But the lack of standard transferable code puts the programmer at a time-consuming disadvantage. After learning to write a program for one computer, he must rewrite it for another. Because of a computer's wide range of applications, languages are specialized. Fortran for science and math. COBOL for business. Logo for education. The more friendly a high-level language, the more translation it requires before it can be executed at the machine level, and correspondingly, the slower it runs. In some cases, lack of speed at the machine level is a trade-off for quick interaction with the user. Adding a third layer of complexity to computer programming is the assembly language, required to translate high-level languages into machine code. Programs written in assembly language are faster in execution, but more difficult to write than those in a high-level language. Software firms are developing more powerful, portable languages for use in micros, but as long as computer manufacturers design exclusivity into their products and languages, users are faced with the same dilemma. Machines that will communicate with everyone except each other. Our guests today are Paul O'Grady. Paul is Executive Vice President for Strategic Development at Microfocus, and Paul works with COBOL. And next to Paul, Dave Eisenberg, a senior engineer and software developer with Apple Computers, and Dave works with Pascal. Gary. You know, Stuart, there's been a lot of, there have been a lot of languages around for several years that are sort of considered traditional languages like uh, PL1, Fortran, uh, COBOL is a good example of that. And one of the difficulties in the small computer industry is trying to bring those down into uh, really usable languages. Mm -hmm. Uh, nowadays, people expect a lot more interaction in the way they deal with computer systems. And I know that Microfocus has been working on COBOL, trying to make that more of a personal orientation. So what have you done? Well, we see ourselves, Gary, as in the business of exploding myths about COBOL. The mainframe people have myths about it, that it can't run on this kind of equipment. And the microcomputer people have myths about it, in the sense that they just don't like the uh, language at all, a lot of people. 
Um, what we try to do is we try to differentiate between the environment and the language itself. And the environment in the past for COBOL has been the mainframe environment. And we believe that that is what has led to much dissatisfaction in that environment. What we've done here, though, um, with Personal COBOL, which is one of our latest products, is show what we believe is uh, the kind of thing that can be done and which is very appealing on this kind of equipment. I've already put us into Personal COBOL. Um, Personal COBOL is uh, a combination of an editor, a forms generator, a checker, syntax checker, and uh, a run, uh, the ability to run programs. In this case, um, I'm going to go straight into the uh, forms part, um, and I've already created uh, a form uh, for us. Now, oh, this is a, a form that you created by uh, drawing the lines in and so forth. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Everything that you see on this screen here um, was created by directly keying in um, the lines, the text, the X's, the mm -hmm. square brackets, the whole thing. And I did it in approximately five minutes or so before the uh, program uh, started. Um, what I'm going to do now is to um, start to generate the COBOL for this, because uh, another of the uh, businesses that Microfocus sees itself as being in is trying to redefine the term programming. And programming for us is simply generating code in whatever way possible, the most effective way possible. In this case, we're going to generate all of the code for this screen automatically. Um, that I'll do uh, now. We also uh, wrote this program so that people who have finger trouble like me <laughs> never really crash the program. I hope to prove that. <laughs> um, I'm going to create a complete program, an index program. Um, I position the cursor as it tells me to. And we're now generating COBOL in the lower part of the screen. Now this uh, traditionally, again, if you talk about traditional COBOL programming, you'd start with a program that would, uh, you'd work out all the details of it that would produce this screen. Is that yes. correct? Now in this case, what you've done is you've manually made the screen up by moving the cursor around and it's doing the inverse, it's actually producing the program instead. Is that is right? correct, mm -hmm. yes, and we've already produced it. We've okay. produced the COBOL uh, for that. What I can now do is I can uh, uh, decide whether or not I want to save that. In this case, um, I'll um, exit without saving. I've already created the, uh, the text uh, mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, uh, as I said, some people have <laughs> finger trouble. <laughs> and I always have finger trouble at points like this. Paul, you mentioned that, that some programmers have not liked COBOL in the past. Why is that? What is it about it that created a problem? Um, there is a lot of uh, detail to the syntax. Um, the period at the end of each, set, each uh, COBOL statement often cause problems. But there is also the need to define records at the beginning of a program um, prior to getting into the guts of it, making the program do the work. Uh, however, that comes from the type of application that uh, COBOL was designed to um, bear upon. Um, those are typically data handling applications, file manipulating ha applications. And for that kind of application, it is necessary to create um, the records to start with. And well, in what fact, you worked with here, though, is, is a, again a, a program generation concept. Uh, now, if you talk about forms, you, you put up forms ahead of time and then you generate a COBOL program. Can you do also do that for data structures for accessing files, or is this something that would come up in the, in the future? Um, in terms of the data structures, they're already uh, built into the index sequential file mechanism of the uh, COBOL, uh, and we adhere to the COBOL mm -hmm. standard. But yes, in the future, one can conceive of the ability to input the data structure directly uh, into the program prior to generating mm -hmm. it. Dave, you work primarily with Pascal, and tell us about Pascal and why you like it. What are its special features? One of the nicer things about Pascal is its power of expression in terms of for a small amount of text on the screen, which is given the right program or awfully readable, you can get a lot of power out of it. It allows you to express an algorithm, a method for doing a computation or some process the way you think about it instead of having to force it into some other mold. And that's one of the advantages of COBOL for business applications. It was 
it's built for that, such that you can think in terms of a business or record problem and do it that way. Pascal is similar, but pretty much for more general purpose um, applications. Pascal had uh, several years ago a, a lot of interest in terms of using it as a systems language, and it was it was sort of touted as the all-purpose language for doing everything. Uh, what happened? Why why did that not really take place? Pascal was first designed as a language for teaching about computing and computer science, and even its inventor admitted Nicholas Wirth advent, in, admitted that that was what it was for, and he's been at work lately on something called Modula, which is designed to take over from Pascal in terms of the systems area, which lets you get closer to the machine level, but still again have the power of expression that Pascal has. Paul, in, in coming up with something like personal COBOL, COBOL we think of as, as you say, a mainframe, big corporation mm -hmm. environment type language, what kind of use, what kind of application do you see with something like personal COBOL? Well, we see uh, not just the classic business data processing applications, we see personal applications such as diary application, personal filing applications and we also see um, office automation applications all being applicable to COBOL. They all require data handling and file maintenance which COBOL was originally designed for. I think it's also important to think of a COBOL as, as being a system implementer's language that is it's not the kind of a language that that you really promote as say an end user language is that is that correct? I would but agree more, with that. So more to the kind of an individual who is going to go out and, and write some extensive programs and then go off and sell those those programs and, and so there's a whole layer of, 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 of programming languages that fit in that category that maybe an end user might might not even want to consider at least until they've had some experience with with programming languages. Yes, I agree. I think um, none of the uh, standard, uh, the normally accepted programming languages are applicable for end users at this point, mm -hmm. personally. Not even basic. <laughs> okay, well, our third guest is going to talk to us about fourth, and that's coming up in just a moment. Joining us now is Elizabeth Rather. Elizabeth is president of Forth Incorporated of Hermosa Beach, California. Elizabeth, tell us about Forth. What makes that a unique programming language? It's unique in two respects. Uh, first, it uh, is the only language that I'm aware of that was designed for first from first principles to run in a small computer doing interactive software development for real-time applications. The second area that it's unique relates to uh, Gary's remark early in the program when he mentioned the three uh, levels of programming, and fourth incorporates all of them. You can work right down at the machine code level when you need to. Uh, you can do system programming in fourth. In fact, the operating system that we're running on here was all written in fourth. Uh, and you can do very high-level kinds of, of things, very high-level application-oriented uh, programming. For example, we have here a, a graphics program that is loaded, and I have a, a list of a large number of uh, demo programs that I could run here. I'm going to try one of them called Logos, which draws, it's not related to the language <laughs> logo, it uh, draws our company's logo, which is a little bit chauvinistic, but the principal thing that this is illustrating, this is a rather complex figure here, and we're doing uh, area fill, which is a fairly sophisticated uh, graphics technique, and it's doing it very fast and very well. It's now got everything all white except for what was concealed in the little spots there, and eventually we'll be able to make even the little spots go away. But there, there are high-level words that put together this entire process, and I can show you some of them. I can say... Was that, was that uh, entirely done in fourth as far as the... Was it any assembly language involved in that area, Phil, or was that entirely done in fourth? No, there is some assembly mm -hmm. language. So it's a mixture um, of those two in yes, fourth. Yes, and see. you mm -hmm. put in as much assembly language okay. as you need either to control hardware directly or to make things run fast, and you notice mm -hmm. this, this is a very fast program. Mm -hmm. But you have... Um, the high-level version, I can say locate logos, um, uh, locate fill, for example. This is the, uh, the area fill routine, which is written in code because area fill is something that needs to run very, very mm -hmm. fast. So you have assembly language code here. And then we have uh, some other words called dark and light, 
So that part are of this what is we call language. high level. Part of this is assembly language. You're showing us part of this is fourth and a fourth statement. Is that true? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, the word dark, for example, that I'm highlighting here, makes the screen go dark, mm -hmm. like that. And it simply picks up the color and blackens the screen and then resets what the previous color was so that when you draw something again, you'll draw it in whatever color it was. And so what we're can, seeing right here, the, highlight, high level things. the highlighted line itself is fourth in this case. Huh? Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Gary, you have your company, Digital Research, has Logo out I'm now. I just happen to have a disc with me. <laughs> and maybe you could load up Logo for a minute and show us uh, how Logo give me can, some help over there with compare us to these other languages. Dave, while we're waiting for Logo uh, to boot up there, uh, let me ask you, are there always going to be all these different languages, or are they going to merge into a smaller number? Well, it would be nice to have an ideal language, but I don't think it will ever really happen. Uh, mostly because, well, for example, COBOL, which we saw earlier, is designed and used primarily for business applications. Fourth is designed for real-time applications. Logo is designed for education, teaching people to program. And well, when you discuss languages, it almost becomes a religious argument. But really, a language is just a tool. And it's like arguing, well, which is better, a hammer or a screwdriver? And you tell me what you want to do with it, and then I'll tell you which one's better. I think that's probably the most important point about languages is that it's, if you use the right one for the right application, then it's the most effective thing you can do. Uh, Logo is like uh, a lot of different interpreted languages. They give, it gives you a, an immediate feedback to the, uh, uh, to the work that you're doing. And what I'll do here, I'm just going to make this uh, screen into a split screen. And I'll show you what I mean by the immediate interaction. Uh, for example, if I type uh, forward uh, 30, then you see the pointer, or the turtle is called, moved in a direction. Now that's immediate feedback to what you typed in. Now a lot of programming languages like Fortran or uh, let's say many Pascal versions are what they call compiled, compiled languages and you don't get immediate feedback. You have to go through an edit step and a compile step and maybe even linkage editing. And that requires a lot of abstraction, a lot of thinking about what you're doing. Uh, where languages that are interactive like Logo and Forth and other interpreters give you immediate feedback. Now this next thing I'm going to sh load in here is called uh, Blackjack, and it happens I'm to be a demo program. program. Right? You're familiar with that one? Okay. Now the reason I'm loading this one, this happens to be uh, an example of how you, know, you use turtle graphics or graphics to draw uh, pictures. And this particular program was written by a 13-year-old in, in about uh, three or four days. Now, it was a rather precocious 13-year-old. Yeah, your son. That's well, not no, quite actually, <laughs> <laughs> genetically <laughs> superior. <Gary. laughs> it was actually his friend. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, the point of it is that uh, you can you can do things like this, like a little game of, of uh, blackjack, without a great deal of effort in a in a language that's interactive and graphical in nature. <clears throat> One of the nice things about these languages, where you define your own words is that you can make it read fairly close to English. You can actually pick up a program and read it. Gary, uh, <laughs> while, while you're playing blackjack the there, <laughs> ma many, most new computer users get exposed to BASIC as their kind of language, and, and we're not, we haven't really talked about that yet. You're showing how easy it is to do a game like this in Logo. How is it better than BASIC? What are the problems in BASIC as a programming Well, language? BASIC is, uh, it historically came from Fortran. It has a lot of the uh, uh, original problems of Fortran. The Fortran was, is one of the, in fact, may have been the very first, I guess, high-level programming language, um, recognized high-level programming language. And so BASIC sort of followed that genealogy and is, has, has a scientific orientation to it, step-by-step uh, -step breakdown of the problem into, into simple, uh, simple steps that, that sometimes not really the, the best way to think about the, the breaking a problem apart. Now, Logo came from the uh, MIT Learning Project, where they thought about the problem of problem solving itself, and then the language that would be under, an underlying language that would be good for that. Um, so I think basic is just is is a it's it's a it's an easy language to learn, but it has its limitations as soon as you start to do anything complicated. Well, basic was designed to be learned quickly by college undergraduates doing very simple things. It wasn't designed to do either sophisticated programs, nor was it designed to grow. And um, I think both Forth and Logo have the capacity to grow in the sense that you can teach them new things. And there is a, a learning process going on in the computer or between the programmer and the computer, which is very similar to the learning process of teaching a small child to do new things. Well, I think that's interesting with Logo also is that, is that it, uh, 
it, it's sort of a bait and switch tactic in the sense that you sort of get uh, children interested in in the language because of the graphics because they think of mm -hmm. it as a big track that they program and runs around on the floor in this case a turtle but behind it is a language a lisp which was used it has been used for years in artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and all the lisp processing and uh, that's a part of lisp is also part of logo and uh, so there's uh, the fourth and lisp have, share some actually some uh, some foundations that are somewhat similar Dave, are there any new languages on the horizon, or do we have a finite number now? Um, the last roster of programming languages that I saw had about seven or 800 <laughs> names in it, and I don't see an end in sight. A lot of languages are designed for one specific thing. I guess you'd call them almost a toy language, except to the person who invents it. <laughs> um, so most of them, are, I think, are offshoots of the main languages, like Fortran, COBOL, ALGOL, or Lisp. And yeah, as, as long as people have ideas for things they want to do, they'll invent a new language. So it's a kind of evolutionary process, I think all of you said, where one language kind yeah. of builds on Well, I on think the next. also it's, there's a, it's a, a matter of getting started as far as learning a language. Once you've lear learned one language, it's not very difficult to start picking up other languages. And some, but it seems to be a threshold to get over the very first time. Uh, so I think that's an interesting thing about learning languages, that you get started at least. Okay, well, we started and we're finished. Thank you very much for being with us and thank you for joining us in this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution.